So today is May 2, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Siddharata mm -hmm. Extinction Nadi. Um, uh, what topics did we want to continue on from last week? Uh, or did anyone have any questions? If nobody's got any questions, I just wanted to talk about uh, Kevin on Friday, just um, raise a point about something he mentioned. In religion. Um, yeah, I think go ahead. I don't think there's anybody. Yeah, so the, the comment he made, I feel we must pick it up again with him because I fundamentally disagreed with it. And he said, if I kind of paraphrase him, that sovereign individuals and people that are really how should I say, not autonomous. He really did call them sovereign individuals, I think was the phrase he used. But he said that he's found that religious people are normally that way um, and non-religious people are not. And I thought that was terribly, terribly wrong. And I think, uh, you know, it's just so damned obvious that in all the traditions that egolessness is just a, just a fundamental part of them. And if you, if you look at the transhumanists, um, uh, particularly like Ken Wilber and Eckhart Tolle, even the new Eckhart Tolle, the new age guys, all these things that are, you know, the, the new awakening kind of people, they all of the same mindset. And that's that you have to get over this idea of individuality and ego. So I would say that anybody that has a strong ego, they really, what he's talking about is kind of libertarian, what, what comes to mind immediately with what he's saying, is kind of the libertarian um, rednecks, <laughs> to say, for want of a better word, is these small-minded, Bible-thumping, individualist uh, libertarians. I say, that's not somebody I would call spiritual, that's somebody I would call indoctrinated uh, by religion. So. I, I feel exactly the, the opposite, and I feel that you know any, any sage from Ramana Maharshi to the Buddha or Christ is saying that you know you, you have to lose your individuality. It's you know that's that's the message. So since he goes for Jesus, I think the 
message of, uh, you know, an, it's easier for a um, an camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven is exactly talking against that point. And that it, so in case you don't know that quote um, from, I think it's from, I can't remember which gospel it is, but anyway, what it, it's on the Sermon on the Mount. So um, I think anyway, um, I have to fact check, but, but when he talks about that, um, uh, the eye of a needle, a lot of people misinterpret it and assume, well, you'll, a camel will never go through an eye of a needle. The, the background on it was the eye of a needle was a gate in Jerusalem. So it was the, it's, it's an important detail because the gate was a tiny little gate that only allowed one person through without any baggage. So it, you could conceivably squeeze a camel through that gate. It was just a, a sentry hole, just by your keyhole gate. And so what uh, Jesus is actually saying is that a rich man has too much ego and too much baggage. And so they can't get into the kingdom of heaven unless you take all that baggage off. It is almost conceivable that you could get a camel through that, that gate if it didn't have any baggage. So it's not to say that rich men will never go to heaven. It's the, the key thing, which is how it's often interpreted, is anti-rich. It's saying, no, it's anti-ego. Is rich people are well known for having, you know, status and ego. And so I, I don't know, can anybody think of a better reference for saying, you know, to get rid of your ego? There's must be lots, I think, in the New Testament. That say roughly the same the same thing. So I just think it's wrong. But what do you think? What, what does anybody else think of that school? Um, the Sermon of the Mount, where he talks about blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek. Is that the meek shall inherit the earth? Yeah, yeah, the meek yeah. But they all, the they all saying, you know, ditch your ego. He's not saying, oh, yeah. you know, be a sovereign individual, make sure, keep your powder dry and your Bible on hand and, you know, shoot the engines as they come over the hill. That's completely made up horseshit that rednecks made up all on their own. But it's it's not religion. That's that's dogmatic uh, fanaticism. It's, it's national socialism is what it is. Yeah, and it, it also um, appeared in his answer to uh, Collapse, you know, the way he talked about uh, organizing little groups and getting into primitive kind of, you know, that sort of, that that was, yeah, we could go back on that when we when we talk with him again. I, I have some questions to ask him too. Yeah, and I, 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 I said that some people had commented that, that we wanted to go a bit more into our our view on rebellion resistance and that some yeah. some of his followers were interested in that aspect of our of our um, conversation and of our position so maybe we could also answer to that yeah i thought where we ended it was where we were going to pick it up again and he he ended just on a note of saying where i was suggesting you know a, a, a general resistance because you know we could take over the mic from you know all these systems they're putting in place they go both ways they could you know whoops, and then he ended off saying well isn't that megalomania but i think the opposite i think i think what he's doing is megalomania because he thinks he's one lone guy against the system and what he doesn't realize is this is a war that's been going on um for a very long time so for example I want to ask him, like, okay, you're a Christian. Like, where where's the Pope sit in this cosmology of individualism and the transhumanists and the transpersonalists? Um, I think transpersonalism was invented by Henry James in a variety of re religious experience. I think that was the first time the word came out. But I I did a little Google engram search on three words, uh, the engram viewer in Google, if you know what that is, it's, I, I love that thing because it tells you how often a, a phrase or an engram and group of words is used in all the literature in Google. I mean, basically everything in the English language you can assume all the way up till 2019 now. And so you can track its usage over time and you can see fantastically interesting things. But what surprised me was I did um, transpersonal, transhuman, and um, transpersonal, transhuman, 
on transsexual. And so if you, if you put those in, the transhumanism is used tremendously and, and all the way back to the 19th century, transpersonal. Transhuman starts in 1960. And with, with Norbert, uh, Norbert Wieners, the, the human use of human beings, the, which was, was uh, just mentioned with that Alison, uh, Alison, what's her name again? Alison McDowell. McDowell, yeah. So uh, Alison McDowell just mentioned that uh, nobody, and I think we did. We also mentioned. I was talking to somebody else recently about it as well. But it, the the Macy Foundation, the cyberneticist stuff. I've done videos about them, and then this um, that's where transhumanism comes in. So that's that's very recent. Um, and so and it's it's not very popular. You think transhumanism would be extraordinarily popular? But it has a big slice of the mind space and the media, but it's not popular. It, it appears popular because they push it like mother of God, do they push it? But the average person loathes it. And so anyway, I don't think it's a big, uh, me, me, uh, you know, megalomaniac thing to say, well, you could actually take this over because I don't know what Kevin realizes that this has been going on for a very long time. We, we only one part of a large kind of, you know, okay, we talked about the superorganism too. So the, what, what I think the world is going into, and this is a very commonly held belief, is the world is going through a shift. It's going through this massive transition. Now, if you, you know, kind of um, a gamer and, you know, you like Star Trek and you a bit of a futurologist and a bit of a tech geek, then to you, this transformation appears to be the singularity, the technological singularity, where AI, you know, everything kind of goes through a phase change where everything enables everything else at an accelerated pace. And we kind of uh, like, like um, you know, water going to ice or ice transitioning to water. It's, it, the whole thing changes uh, phase in a way. So. Um, everybody has that feeling. Now they think that's technology. Suddenly we become super smart. We solve all problems and stuff. AI, you know, runs off. And so you get Elon Musk and all these guys that think that way. Gates and Bezos, all of those guys, they're thinking that way. Now, on the other side, the people that think, well, we are going through a great transition. I agree from like, uh, you know, if you, if you take, um, Anybody from like Ken, Ken Wilber to Alan Watts to um, uh, Julian Silverman and, um, you know, all these guys are they, they're Eckhart Tolle is, is like the new, new, new earth is Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle's thing. And everybody feels that, you know, there's a, a, a tipping point coming, a social tipping point or a psychological or, or mental tipping point into this kind of super organism. Now, what the battle is for is what form this superorganism is going to take. This collective intelligence that is, seems to be emerging is, is, is it Hobbes's vision of individuals um, and fundamentally what I call dead stuff. It's, it's chronos, it's control, it's digital. So you have this fundamentally technical, digital, mechanical view of where the perfected uh, human comes from. So it's an idea that when we are perfected, we become silicon. I say like, well, have you had a look at silicon lately? It's dead as a doornail. So what they romanticizing is our death and they don't realize it. Now, there's another team that are humanists and you could put like Russell Brand and, uh, you know, Chris Hedges, all these guys, you know, Roger Hallam, all these guys, um, Gail Bradbrook, they, they all feel that, you know, it's all about humans. We, we, we can't be subservient to the digital realm. So that's all like analog and living and organic and human and quite mammalian brain. So I characterize the first as, you know, alien cortex and the second as particularly you know, mammalian brain. But these guys, the humanists, have been chipping away at it since you know ancient Sumeria. This is not egalomaniac. So so we we all working together. We don't have to you know basically know each other's name and addresses. We all working basically what I often 
call the the uh, intersubjectivity synchronicity telephone. We're all wired in on it. I, d I didn't invent that from that, by the way. That was um, uh, um, who's who's the psych psychedelic guy now in the um, the uh, Terence McKenna. No. No, not Terence McKenna. Uh, I was thinking of Timothy Leary, but it's not. Timothy, it's, no, um... it's it's the guy on the bus, the further bus, and Ken Ken Kesey, Ken Kesey. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I, th I think it was him that, that. But anyway, that was the phrase that in Tom Wolfe's book, the uh, you know, psychedelic electric Kool Aid, whatever that book was, I can't remember now. Um, so, uh, the yeah, the Kool Aid electric Kool Aid something test. Uh, <laughs> it escapes me, but anyway, that that book is where where I think that phrase came out of. But what what that is is about that everybody that understands this and is on that wavelength is tuned in to this intersubjectivity. You don't have to call them out. It, I mean, it helps to make contact now and again, but it's exactly what you say: is like tune in, um, turn on, and drop out, and that tuning in was tuning into the intersubjectivity synchronicity telephone. It's basically saying to it like, guys, these guys are nuts. Elon Musk, all these guys, they're nuts. The whole world has gone fucking barking nuts. Now, a lot of people can spot each other across the room and say, this just goes on fire. It's like, let's just head for the exits. And we all coordinating voicelessly and sometimes voiced, but we all working together. So. So Kevin is a megalomaniac because he thinks he's working on his own as this lone, you know, hero. And he's like, no, if you drop your ego, you can become a part of this vast army that is fighting for the future of humanity. And the future of humanity is a spiritual humanist one, if you believe in life uh, like we do. If you believe in death, it's a digital, silicon, dry, dead, controlled world. And that's what we're trying to avoid. But you see, if you if you go and have a look at something, I, I mentioned a bit on cults and things like that, but if you go and have a look at like Assassin's Creed. If you go to, <laughs> the guys who did Assassin's Creed put this out there in blatant term. They 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 were doing gamification for social change. You go and have a look at the guys behind Ubisoft. They all go into the esoteric traditions. They all basically, for the Freemasons or all these guys is like, on this side is guys like uh, the Pope. So, so okay, take Jesus and this Jesus thing that they, they seem to have going on in this redneck backwater. Uh, they, if you have a look at the early Christian church, there are two things going on. If you if you talk to any biblical scholar, they'll tell you that you're getting half the story. Biblical scholars know that if you if you look at the available text and some of the 400 other books that didn't make it through the Council of Nicaea and just got wasted, is if you look at the biblical thing, what's clear is Saint Paul is going around bitching and moaning and fighting and this invisible. Occasionally, you hear the, about this wizard called Simon, and you know, so and you're like, you think, who is he going up against? Now, there are various things, but one of them is Demeter. Ephes in Ephesus, he runs into a lot of trouble with people in Demeter. That's Sibylle, right? So, so it's um, the, it's the mother goddess that he's going up against. It, it, what's what's strikingly obvious in the Christian uh, Bible is they've expunged feminism to a ridiculous length. And and so, what Christianity, according to you know the papal see in in Rome, is Saint Paul's cult. So Saint Paul is actually persecuting the humanists. So it's clear that Jesus is a humanist. He's an Essene, and and Saint Paul is the Gestapo. He's going out to crush these guys. And then he has this Damascus moment where he realizes, oh shit, I made the biggest mistake in the world. He's actually the Messiah. And then he goes on his little riff. But the riff he goes on is the transhumanist riff. He, he says that God is straight out there and it's basically, St. Paul is the evil one. The legacy in the Christian church that we have today, it's St. Paul's cult. It is a death cult. 
it ends in apocalypse go and read the book of revelation it's up uh, christianity is an, an apo apocalyptic snuff cult. it's it's run for two thousand years but it's still got the snuff in it basically you the, these guys are waiting for the rapture so the, these are the, the the same guys who are the transhumanists who um these are the evil ones so just go and look at assassin's creed they lay it all out there for you <laughs> and so you know so what's so odd about kevin is he's he's clearly a gnostic when you start pushing him on his religion he's on our side so the gnostics and the albigens inheritor the, the cathars all these guys were persecuted they're the same guys that that St. Paul was going up against right in Ephesus and on all his, uh, you know, his, his, um, when he was touring around before he got to Rome. Uh, but the, it's the same guys. They become the Freemasons and all these branches. They're basically the Johannites. They, it's, there's this huge underground. So always the surface is these millenarian, utopian death cults, cultists. And that's our oh overt culture the underground culture is humanistic and so so clearly a number of people think we're coming to the end game because now it's going to consume the whole planet and so this is we are getting towards the the battle at armageddon but what the the outcome of the battle is it's life against death it's it's humanity and team human against these mechanical dead people these are automatons so you can see you know, everybody from there, even David Icke gets it. So David Icke is kind of wacky as hell, but he intuitively he gets it. And so he, he calls people all like reptiloids and stuff. What well, that means the reptilian brain. So what he sees in them is a reptilian brain. He makes a straight connection to the reptilian brain, calls them reptiloids. Then all these Michael Shermers and <laughs> blinkered idiots you know, linear thinking normies, they're like, oh, reptiloids. No, he's got a deep insight. You must think of it as metaphorical. But these transhumanists are fundamentally the reptilian brain in an unholy alliance with the alien cortex. So the alien cortex is all digital, it's semiotic, it's all about signs, it's linguistic. And so, you, you know, Jordan Peterson, he's a fucking retarded idiot, but you can't see it because he's, he's eloquent. So, so you can see the alien cortex, but, but Jordan Peterson does brain farts that are just like, what the fuck are you talking about, you stupid dickhead? I mean, I'll give you an example. Like he was, I saw one thing, I think Kevin was, was critiquing it. And right, right in the middle of uh, it is, is Jordan Peterson says, well, you know, if we were all equal, then there wouldn't be any trade. If we all had all the same stuff, there wouldn't be any, tra any trade. He said, what the fuck, are you a retard? I mean, seriously, the, you know, you couldn't give anybody back rubs or blow jobs because we're all equal. We can't scratch your, each other's back. We can't do each other's work. I mean, we're all equal. Then there can't be any trade. He, he really, Jordan Peterson is so fucking stupid that he thinks all trade is arbitrage. That basically, if I have a lot and you have a lot and you have different stuff, then we can trade. No, we can fucking, you know, make love to each other, you stupid fucking idiot. What's wrong with this idiot? But he gets considered, uh, you know, very, very smart guy. And he's like, why? Because it has this layer of gibberish over the top that sounds coherent. And what that is, is the alien cortex. So what the alien cortex is, is, is in uh, this unholy alliance with the reptilian brain. The characteristics of the reptilian brain are this selfishness that you see in the sovereign individual talk. Lizards want to be sovereign individuals. Lizards don't really run in packs like Jurassic Park. They're really solitary kind of things. If you look at a crocodile, they fight for territory. They, they Mating is an extremely difficult thing, and it's generally, you know, I lay the eggs, you fuck off and, so, you know, uh, fertilize them. But they, they're not uh, lizards and reptiles and stuff, and snakes might mate and stuff, but their world is fundamentally territorial. It's uh, very much the I and the other, I see you. It's, 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 it's a bunker mentality that this rep, you can see the reptilian brain is, 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 is thinking that way. And it all emerges as, you know, party politics on the right wing and preppers. And it's like, I'm going into my bunker. Oh, like a little snake. Into the, yeah, he's the forked tongue. But it, it's, 
and then and then you see them all like they get dressed in military gear. And he's like, oh, it's all, all camouflage, and it looks like the Ninja Turtles. Coincidence? I don't think so. The reptilian brain is looking at any cop uh, that that selected that uniform. You know that they, you know, the riot police or something. They were presented a whole lot of looks by the guys that designed those uniforms. And the guys went through them and then, ah, that one's too namby-pamby. Oh, this one. And they eventually get, oh, this is the one we want. This, this says it. And what is it? It looks like a reptile. Why? Because the cop's reptilian brain is talking. So I want to look like that. And then they wear shades, you know, sunglasses. That's because, you know, for a reptile, it's like, I can see you, but you can't see me. Ambush situation, whoa, power. And it's, like, it's so fucking reptilian. These guys have no self-awareness at all. So, uh, but you take that territoriality, this nationalism in that kind of reptilian brain, you put this thin layer of um, intellectualizing on top of it to justify the reptilian brain, and you're off to the races as a bloody Nazi. But now have a look on the other side, the more feminist, um, eco-feminist, uh, you know, XRs, much more touchy-feely and stuff. It's mammalian brain. It's about caring and sharing, and they're all on about love all the time. But also, you get this, you know, unholy alliance between the alien cortex and the mammalian brain. The alien cortex in, in there, on, on the right wing, like with with XR, you get this kind of babble. That's, that's also this kind of rationalizing nonsense. And it just streams on and on like verbal diarrhea. But it's 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 also the alien cortex speaking for the mammalian brain. You get the weirdest arguments known to man. They don't really hold together. They're all incoherent. And so you get you get some things from like the mammalian brain where you get uh, you know the mammalian brain is all about rear, child rearing and making sure you know there's not favors favoritism amongst you know i love all my children equally kind of ideal so you get a lot of that you know egalite and fraternite and all of that um that out of it um but then you get these weird intellectual arguments that don't make any sense so you know you, i've heard feminists say you know well gender is gender doesn't actually exist it's just a, um, a construct of the the male patriarchy he went hang on a minute how's there male patriarchy if gender doesn't exist it's just horseshit i, I know you're right because i I've, I've been in contact with uh, some people who now want to rear their children um in a non-gender way when they're babies like they don't they it's called the uh, I can't remember, it has a, one of those feminist names, but it's non-gender. So you have a baby, but it's either a boy or girl. It just, you'll have to just, it will have non -binary. to. Non-binary, non-binary. Non-binary. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I just, that's quite recent. And it's, it's. Uh, I think it's an abomination, <laughs> to be honest. Well, um, it, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, we, 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 we human beings and we kind of, sec we, we're very sexual through, throughout our existence yeah and, yeah and it's not strictly defined on either sex i mean we, we're somewhere between um chimps and bonobos and you know bonobos will screw, to bonobos. Will screw anything yeah. <laughs> anything that's not pinned down male female in any end the bonobos yeah, yeah because the chimps only 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 uh, have sex for reproduction but the bonobos yeah. do it to to reinforce um links in the in the in the group and to reduce uh, social tension to relax yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. But so so we halfway between you know chimps which are very nasty animals everybody thinks they're all nice because you know there's the three trees chimps and you know we all think oh look aren't they human and uh, it's like bollocks chimps are nasty houses <laughs> they uh if you get on the wrong side of the chimp they're about eight times stronger than a man and that what they'll do is they'll go through your nuts they'll, they'll try and castrate you in a fight and they'll do it very successfully with one bite so moral of the story don't get uh, too sentimental about chimps they're fucking nasty but anyway we're, we're somewhere between <laughs> between those two so you know we the, so gender is fluid and stuff and that's why i say you don't you know we we just do weird stuff we're human but don't say 
you know, I mean, just saying somebody is non-binary is, is saying like, what's that even mean? You're just saying yeah. they're human. No one's, no one's binary. Okay. So just fuck off with the non-binary. It refuses the fluidity. It, that's what it, it refuses this possibility, this uh, fluidity. This, but the mere uh, fact you say non-binary yeah. implies that everybody else is binary, which is horseshit to start with. So it's, it's like, you know, it's just like, guys, just, just let everybody be human. So humans do anything to anything occasionally. You just, you know, just get over it. But uh, yeah. So anyway, that, so, but uh, yeah, so I, I, the whole point of my little rant here is, is trying to make you see that this is a Teutonic battle building and it's the, you know, it's the, it's, it's a Titanic battle between life and death and and death is represented by these transhumanists they they are a death cult and so yeah what, what i'd like to say to uh julia mcdowell if we talk to her is is she she i don't think she gets this bit that you know it's not bad to live in a in these kind of controlled worlds that they're talking about, these authoritarian worlds, it's basically they're just regimented. So it's like being in the army. That it's you see a lot of what these people are doing is they're egocentric. So they don't even even um, uh, you know in 1984, um, you you can see that Smith right he's an egotist, and I I think that. Um, Huxley and um, George Orwell were really their egotists and what they don't want to lose their ego. They don't want to become a part of the super ego. And so they, they terrified of a big brother and Ingsoc and all of this because it represents this, this super organism. They don't want to dive into the sea, lose their individuality in this, you know, immersion in the, in the bigger hole. And so, so they kind of, Ex express that terror. Now, that's not what the danger is. You can only go so far with that because most people will like their chains. And the reason is a lot of people like the army. I love the freaking army, not, but not for the, the reason that most people, I, I did because it was a big adventure. It was, it was fun and games and millions and millions of dollars of machinery, which you could just play on like a kid. It was like, like a, you know, like a candy store. For me but for the average joe that likes the military and signs up they do it because they don't want to think they, they they love somebody doing the thinking for them there's no pressure in the military it's clearly defined you you do this this is where the guardrails are follow the follow the orders and nothing bad happens to you you get fed you basically uh, you don't have to make decisions people don't like making decisions you have all the decisions made for you and you have this kind of social contract that, well, sure, you're a commodity and they'll do cost benefit analysis when they send you at the machine guns, but you are still on the same side and they kind of uh, altruistic in the sense that, the, you know, a far, you know, the shepherd won't sacrifice his sheep too much. So they won't they will try not to sacrifice you too much. But they, when you go over the top in Flanders, they're doing a cost benefit. Ah, well, ledger of death. We'll, we will lose 10%, but that's, you know, considering we'd actually gain this advantage and the consequentialist kind of thinking comes in and says, yeah, 10% is worthwhile. Well, if you tell the general, actually, you're one of those 10%, you'd be like, oh, fuck that plan. <laughs> He's not in that plan. He's an individual. But the, the, the guys that don't want to think, or the rank and file, they have an okay deal if you want to be a sheep. So that it's not so bad. A lot of people will go for it. They say, I, keep me away from the wolves. Uh, just just give me regular meals and I'll go into the meat grinder later. It's, it's, I'll take that bargain. The average Joe will take that bargain. That's not what's at stake. It's important to get that through to people like Julia and to, to <laughs> Kevin, but he doesn't listen to squat. But, the, but the, the, this is what the problem is. That dead world, let's call it the digital world, the transhuman world, it's not 
sustainable. It's not survivable. We will snuff if we go down that, that route. So, so the reason is simple, is they have to grow. It's a, it's a kind of a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, because it's a dead world, it has to keep on feeding and expanding its horizon. It basically, it has to keep on killing and moving on. It's, you know, Derek Jensen's thing where he says, you know, forests before us and deserts dog our heels. Deserts dog our heels because it's really like a fire. It's not creative. It's destructive. That digital world is destructive. So it's, it's eating like a disease, it's like necrotizing fasciitis. It's kind of crawling through fresh flesh, killing it as it goes and leaving ash behind. And so, so it has to keep moving and growing. So if you make the world like Klaus Schwab wants to do, it's unsustainable. It has to keep on growing. Every one of those predicated in every one of those plans that they have is growth. They have to keep on feeding this Moloch that they've invented. It is insatiable. And so that's the problem, is we will run out of living material on Earth, and when there's only machines, those machines are not sentient. They're not living. They're no more living than a wind-up toy. They, you, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a delusion what these people are under. They think in terms of, oh, we've created life in artificial intelligence. They know fuck all about artificial intelligence. I've worked on artificial intelligence. I've worked a good deal of my career in artificial intelligence. And I'll tell you, anybody from Stephen Hawking to Elon Musk that talks wax lyrical about, about um, artificial intelligence, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Artificial intelligence is not intelligence. It's, it's, it's a mimic of human intelligence. It only exists because it's borrowing from human intelligence. The big data and all the stuff they're collecting, it's all human intelligence. Google search, Google search engine is not intelligent. It's not an example of artificial intelligence. It's using human intelligence. It's using page rank algorithm. It's saying, oh, some human, oh, thank you for your intelligence, connected these two things. And these, you know, were strengthened by this other human that agreed. So it's you, it's, it's, it's the same carnivorous necrophilic fucking system. It's feeding off our intelligence. And then these cunts come and claim, oh, we've, we've got AI. And then they make outrageous claims like, you know, soon the AI will be cleverer than us. How? How can you feed a beast human intelligence and get more human intelligence than you fed it? He's saying, like, you know, he, he, soon this demon, this Moloch, will be bigger than the whole herd of cows that we feed it. How? It's not physically possible. You just don't know what AI is. You're just talking horseshit. And so these guys are talking horseshit. So what, what's going to happen if, if they pers pursue this is that the, uh, it will wind up being a world of silicon. They say, well, we upload our intelligence. It's, it's meaningless. There's, if you go back to the, the original cyberneticist like Forrester, and, and you can see guy, guys interviewing him. And, and, you know, young geek. I, I remember seeing him in one video with this young geek and, uh, in the 80s, and he's, he's interviewing Forrester. And he said, you know, uh, well, you know, one day we'll be able to upload ourselves to silicon. Um, it must have been one of the very first times this horseshit idea ever came out. But, but clearly he picked it up somewhere in the 80s. And, and Forrester had obviously never heard about it. And he, he said, yeah, young man, what do you mean by um, uploading yourself to a silicon? <laughs> it's like, you cannot explain. What, what does it mean? If I take a photograph of you and make a digital image, have I uploaded you to my camera? It's, it's nonsense. It, it, so what your brain cells are doing and, and uh, the organic molecules, they have a, a path in history that goes all the way back to the Big Bang. Every particle that's constituted from you has a path in history. You, you cannot just say, no, it's information, and we'll transfer it here. See, that's what Norbert Wiener figured out, that all these guys think information is abstract. There's no such thing as, inf you see, why are they saying you can upload your consciousness to, to silicon? Is they thinking in terms of, again, this abstract uh, concept, which is information, uh, they're thinking, well, 
that's all that's real, just the patterns. Therefore, if we make the same pattern in silicon, that's me. Well, you're not a pattern. There's the big mistake in information theory is that information is not abstract. I challenge you to do any pattern and not reify it in physical reality. You cannot do it. Any idea you've ever had is reified in your neurons. Any Anything on the computer is reified in silicon with switched gates. There is The atoms must be arranged somehow to represent that information. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. And if your information comes from atoms, then it comes from the prima mater. Mother rules. The material rules. Information is just a pattern in the prima mater. They saying, no, it exists in the abstract. Why? Because then they're hoping they can live forever. If it's abstract, it's an ideal form, and an ideal form can live forever. These but guys why, are on the path to death. Why, why is there so little um, people who, who go who contradict the likes of Musk? Um, for example, on human unpredictability, for example. Predictability is something that... that, that it's... it's you know. See, it's because it's because that the people that actually know this stuff are consumed by it. So the most people that actually are in AI and are, are skeptical about it, um, they they don't get a voice, right? So it, an engineer that works in AI or in automation, they they will tell you that this sort of stuff is all overblown and that cars are never going to drive themselves and stuff uh, you see it, it's any you but to understand that you have to be really steeped in the stem subjects mm. so the only people that get steeped in the stem subjects are people that are really sold on the death cult and religion so they're very few apostates of the religion because only guys who know enough to contradict it are you know stem people and already made the devil's bargain so, so, so what happens is the humanists go and study sociology and all the nice shit, ecology and, and all, and then they can feel intuitively that these guys are whack, but they, they, they don't have the STEM uh, stuff to, to actually contradict it on its own terms. So they don't know enough science. They don't know enough about AI and stuff. They can feel it. The intuition is bang on, but they don't know enough to say things like, okay, you know, Stephen Hawking, fucking idiot, fucking idiot, if, if ever there was one. And he said, oh, one day, you know, kind of Elon Musk thing, the AI will take over. It can't. He's not a physicist. He's, he's, Stephen Hawking should have be stripped of every medal he ever had when he said made that statement, because it means fundamentally he doesn't understand his own subject. If he knows physics, it's, it's basically, it's uh, Connor. So Connor's heat engine says that you cannot, Maxwell's demon, Maxwell's demon was, was saying you cannot have machines that fix machines that fix machines. Mm -hmm. The cyberneticists figured that out, Norbert Wiener figured that out, because you're building up entropy. Look, the day you pull the plug on the machines, right, or, or leave the plug in, right, the day humans die is the day that the machines all start running down. They are literally like clockwork, uh, little mechanisms that you wind up, they are literally wind up toys. And and the moment humans stop propping them up, they wind down. And so you think, no, no, you'll have factories and they'll all be... So the factories today, there are a lot of factories, cement factories, most factories you go to today are dark sites. That means they, pro they probably don't have a security guard on site and zero employees. If you go to a cement factory today, there's zero employees. If you go to uh, a machine site, so most of the machines, uh, you know, the cloud, all this electronics, they're in dark sites. They all harden terror against terrorists in low profile buildings in secret locations and they dark. There's nobody there. And they know, then, you know, basically you need masses of access uh, security clearance to get into those places. That's a very interesting information. Yeah. <laughs> you can you can go online fire and fire. so Amazon no, web, web, I, I, AWS Amazon Web Services is most of the shit going on on the mm -hmm. on the, the public internet is now going and certainly government stuff is all hosted now on the, on 
on Amazon. They try to keep all the, the sites distributed around the world and <laughs> Anarchists have labeled every one of them just do a Google search. <laughs> they all uh, uh, basically they have power backup, seventy-two hours. Basically, you, you, all these millennials who think, well, we have this baseline, we have the internet now, so that's kind of like a level we've achieved, and we're never going to drop below that level. You know, it's it's kind of we, you know, they think in terms of gaming. And they think, well, once we've achieved that level and we've made that achievement, we, 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 you know, it's kind of boom, boom, boom. You get the achievement award and you go on. It's like, okay, we made the internet level, so we're never going to go. It's like, dudes, 72 hours, internet gone. There's no power after 72 hours. You one EMP explosion away, it's coming. <laughs> I showed, I posted that thing and just showed you if people get together, they can bring this thing down tomorrow you can save the planet it's just a question of psychology if we ever got enough people together to do that little trick with make a search on the grid it's we've won the problem is that people will not go against the system they, they will not go against the plantation so we have to do this work that we're doing now on these videos to try and get through so that slowly drip by drip and we just hope that when this uh, epiphany comes it will uh, allow people to turn the right way and the right way is against the machine but anyway let me go back to that maxwell demon so if the machines uh these these machines are left on their own like stephen hawking says well you know humans die off and the machines take over elon musk is saying now we need a chip in our brain and we need we need to basically be integrated with AI and be cyborgs because otherwise the AI will replace us and we will be like pets of a robot. Elon Musk is a cretin. He does not understand AI. He's not an engineer. He's a fucking grifter, right? He's, he's, he's a stupid fucking con man. Elon Musk is pulling everybody along because he's a billionaire now done a big grift now now he's untouchable because now billionaires are idols in our in our society he doesn't know what ai is. tell you flat out he doesn't know what ai is it, it, what would happen if we all died is the ai would die with us it would wind down so going back to the factories and what happens in a factory if you look at a machine tooling factory if you look at something that makes car parts or any of these parts they precision engineered if you go to a bmw factory they have a gearbox, the BMW were the first to do a sealed gearbox. A sealed gearbox is an amazing thing because it means that you, you precision engineered things to such perfection, only a German can do it. You, um, you don't have to open or open that gearbox again or put oil in again. That is an amazing achievement. Now, it's, if you go to that factory and have a look at it, it can only be done because each one of the parts and in the supply down the supply chain is automated. So the further you go down the supply chain, the more perfection you can get in, right? If you go and look at the tools and dies that actually machine those parts for the thing, you will find there's a machine, a robot, a robot and it precision engineers is in a very clean room. It, what happens if the tool bit wears down is another machine comes and replaces the tool bit. Here's the problem, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> what happens to that machine that just replaces the drill bit? It goes and gets another drill bit out of a box that's been placed there by an automated thing. Basically, they, the guy, it might be a robot that takes delivery from a truck. Most factories are that way. They don't have a guy on the loading bay, right? The, the, the guy in the truck, the driver, opens the back of the truck. He, he might put it on a pallet for for a robot, but it's generally a robot will pick up those bits, take them to the factory for the other one. Here's the problem. If you have a machine that goes wrong, it, so, so the, those machines can do it with high precision, as much as precision as you put in it, but you cannot get over the Carnot limit. You can't get over the Maxwell Demon limit. So there's entropy involved. Those machines are right. Each time they mill a fantastically perfected surface, they're running down. Entropy is creeping in. Now, at some stage, they're going to break. What happens? You have to send in a fucking human. You need a living organism to come and correct it. Why? 
because of what the, the cyberneticists and Norbert Wiener, why Norbert Wiener eventually went south on cybernetics and this whole wet dream of the machine world is, he realized that to actually have a machine that fixes a machine, it had, a, the doctor needs to, the doctor machine needs to be much more sophisticated. It has to know all the failure modes. It has to be creative in a way. Uh, it has to be a lot more complex than the machine it's fixing. Great. Now, who fixed the fucking doctor machine? You understand the problem? You're starting to see it now. That machine has to be n times more. So, so these these techno fucking idiots don't understand that. Uh, how do I say this without doxing? Myself? Okay, there was a guy I knew who worked for IBM once when, when IBM was the biggest computer company and it was just IBM and Microsoft and Apple was a fucking wet dream. Uh, the, the, uh, he came from N Nabisco. Yeah, basically, uh, this is how fucked up, retarded our, our capitalist system is. Uh, this guy's name was Gerstner. He came as a, C a new CEO for IBM. New f he came from RBR and Nabisco. He was a biscuit manufacturer. But because, you know, financial guys are thick as pig shit, they go like, well, he did great at Nabisco. He'll do great for IBM. Because there's got to be something to, you know, biscuits, high-tech computers. It must be the same. And so, the, so anyway, this guy comes in, taking over a tech company. He doesn't understand diddly squat about tech, but, but he's a tech enthusiast. And he's told everybody on the board, you know, like, hey, you know, like, I love tech. Oh, I can do this. I'll take this company to the stars. He took it into the dirt. IBM, IBM is not a big deal anymore. He took, he took IBM in half. But anyway, one of the ways he halved it was he didn't understand this principle. So when he came in, he says, you know, at that time, they were all about Six Sigma. So that Six Sigma is the, the quality control. So, so that sealed gearbox is a Six Sigma. It means that you have Six Sigma defects. That means zero, I think, nine zeros and a one before you get a defect. You have a defect of nine zeros and a one. Very, very high precision. So he wanted all this in computing, right? So he said, well, where we get there is with self-healing software. Well, the guy I knew, who was a fucking idiot, was dumb enough to go and try and explain to him Gödel's theorem and explain to him why you can't do self-healing software. I mean, it's, it's pretty darn simple. It's like, if, if you're a programmer, you say, like, if you know the failure modes, that's a bug. You would, you would correct them. There's no way that a, a monitoring a piece of monitoring software can, can do diagnosis on the fly figure out what's wrong and heal it. In fact, nobody in computing does that. What all they do when, when systems get into a state, into a troubled state, everybody all over the world, this is, the, this is what happens. You just switch the machine off and switch it back on again. And what that does is get the system into a complex state. There's, there's nobody in computing on any of the servers, any of the millions and teraflops of computing going on, if it gets into an unknown state and gets chaotic or, you know, gets it into an error state, there's nothing that you can do. Nobody diagnoses it. Nobody tries to second guess it and fix it and, you know, analyze it, think maybe this, maybe this, I'll do little Sherlock Holmes. Because they found that if you do that, you'll make it worse. There's nobody can understand a complex system. So, so you just get it back to a known state. The easiest way, easiest and quickest way of doing that is paradorphanon. And that's why they tell you to do that with your computer. Now, this is important because we're about to do exhibit A with the failing ecology of Earth. This is a system we don't understand. It's way too complex. We do not understand the ecology. Klaus Schwab and his Eco Health Alliance and these fuckwits are going to try to take control of the system that they, okay, if they want to take control of the system, I say, you can only, you can only prove that you know how the system works if you can recreate it. But that's elementary. I can't remember who said it. I think everybody from Leonard Susskind to you name it has, has said, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, I think so I can't remember who said it, but it says, somebody said, which was absolutely true, is, is unless you can you can recreate a phenomena from scratch. You do not understand it. And so I say like, great, 
Can you recreate the Earth system? Not even fucking close. You can't even get a cell out of the human being. Craig Fenter got the cell. He, he cheated. He got a, a yeast cell first, put some DNA, and he copied the DNA. He doesn't know what the DNA instructions are. It's a complete fake. So, so you, you cannot, um, uh, what was I trying to say? Uh, oh, yeah. So, all of my parents thought you were comparing you were comparing your analysis of of complex system to the to our, the fate of our planet. Oh no no uh, yeah yeah so so what I was trying to say is that unless you can actually recreate the thing first and unless you can, can create the system. So have we tried? Yes, it was done in Biosphere Two. What happened? Guys got choked with CO two. Remember CO two? Hey, ring a bell. All the fucking greenhouse gases that are killing this planet. And, and the biosphere, uh, that's the problem they had on biosphere too. So they tried to create Earth in a sealed container, doesn't work. So unless you can get Earth in a sealed container like biosphere two and make it work, and even then you don't know what it's doing, you just borrowed things and chucked them in a big um, crucible. But so, so if these nutcases want to do geoengineering or want to control or manage the environment or the ecology step one is you show me it uh, you i'll cut you a piece of the sahara you go and show me your wet fucking dream with a solar panel here and a wind farm over there and regenerative agriculture in the middle do it you've got sunlight you've got fresh air i'll, I'll even grant you fresh water which by the way you haven't got so you go and put your fucking techno utopian, you know, I just read it in the Guardian today bullshit and do it on one square kilometer in the Sahara. And then that's the very least you have to do to say, okay, I understand the system enough to control it. And I'm telling you, you go and do it, you'll fuck up. And the reason I know, I know straight away you'll fuck up. And the reason is that basically a one square kilometer area is we're not evolved for an ecosystem that small. <laughs> so you're gonna have to basically go outside the limit but anyway that's the advanced course <laughs> the, 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 the basic course is if, you know you you have to show that you that before you start seeding the the arctic with microferials or uh, you know microspherics or, or glass is like you get me a clump of ice put it in a sealed container basically in in a laboratory setting uh, absolutely mimic the conditions you show me how that that goes on i'll show you a walrus or some shit and how basically its intestine gets filled with that glass but anyway you know you're gonna fuck up so you show me how you get rid of that glass so 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 all these guys are, oh we can sprinkle it lightly on the arctic no you can't first you have an escrow fund and where you put all the money to clean shit up if it doesn't work step one two you show me the mitigation program and how you get rid of your wet fucking dream of, of this geoengineering nastiness you, you show me how you undo it um, and then basically you, you show that you can actually restore the system and, and set it back working again so that in other words there's no hysteresis so you can get back to where you started from after you've done this wet dream and removed it I'm telling you now you will not be able to but those three things are the basics before you go in this. First, do no harm. And the only way you can prove that you're not doing no harm is if you, if you do those three things. But I'll, I'll tell you straight out that it won't, it won't work. And the reason is, going back to the whole thing, I hope that I've communicated to you why the machines never take over the Earth. It's because they're dead. They, they, do, they do not emerge from the bottom up, from, from the chemistry of the universe. They emerge from the top down from our alien cortex imposed and machined on the world controlled from the top down you cannot go from the top down on the system the, you cannot work against the fundamental system underneath it so in other words you can't sculpt against the grain and that's what they're trying to do with the machines and the, so so what will get you if you do that is the entropy so if you make machines that fix machines or you know try and run themselves or try and recreate themselves the, the entropy will get you it'll grow so it's it's just like you know inbreeding 
and the more you inbreed it, so the more you 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 will get de deleterious um, mutations that just run through the thing. So it's the same in the machine world. The more the tiny imperfection in one thing will ripple, and the machines will not be intelligent or creative enough to 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 fix that. You say, well, how does life do it? So life is pulling a very cunning trick, and it it's taking the entropy and the dead stuff and, and creating order out of it. And so what it's doing is, uh, you go back to my Darwin videos and they're basically three processes. It's, it's a filter feedback loop. So there's emergent intelligence because it's a filter feedback loop. And so that's where our intelligence comes from and that's, that is intelligence. The artificial intelligence is a mimic of our organic intelligence. So that organic intelligence, it's, it's more analog, it's more, um, uh, holistic and it's inseparable from from the wider world you you cannot exist in a, in a little bubble in a in an isolation chamber in a hyperbaric chamber and it's like you can't exist for long you can't i mean even if you're a diver in the north sea oil rig you, you, your system is br is breaking down you, you're starting to to get um hypoxia and stuff it, it's a, it's just it, you can't stay down there forever yeah i mean even if you just get rickets and <laughs> you, the, your system will you know sophie you can talk to that but you can't put somebody in an isolation chamber and keep them going forever and so it the reason is because we're intrinsically connected there is no decoupling from the natural world and so you you, you can have temporary decoupling you can you can go to the moon you can t you can make a biosphere and go to the moon, but it's temporary. It's running down. The clock's ticking. It's, it's like a dead machine. The, the capsules that they go to the moon. That's why Elon Musk is never going to get to Mars, because he's taken a bit of Earth, the living Earth, and transported it to Mars, where he's where it's running. It's dying. As he takes this living, he might as well take a chunk of flesh out of Mother Earth and try and put it on the moon and try and propagate it. It's you can't propagate a vine leaf like that. If you put a vine leaf like that, it would start to decay. It would grow for a while, but then all these other bigger things would start to catch up with you. The, the CO2 starts to catch up with you. The, 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 just the, the water usage and recycling is done at the wrong rate. So it, it would be like an economy that starts to grind on its own gears. And that's the fate of all, all the colonists. So, yeah, the, the experiments they're doing now in China, just trying to do, they put up a space station that's about as big as the ISS. Go and have a look. If you if you scrub all the techno bullshit and rah rah from all this, you know, juvenile, pathetic science journalists, you scrub all that hopium out of there and go and have a look at this the space station. It's a fucking wreck. <laughs> it's a fucking wreck of entropy. It's just a PR campaign. Any astronaut will tell you it's it's PR and fuck all that everybody knows those space stations are not viable and they're carrying on because they're fucking liars. So you get these guys like me who know the shit. We keep our mouth shut so we get a paycheck. But guy, guys like that who, who understand what I'm saying, you you got to come over <laughs> to our side because we know how the system works and we can unravel it but the the most people on the tech side is what you were saying before is they're very egotistical because they are left-brained then then that's the center of our, of our ego i i have zero success with getting programmers and stuff there are few there are few i know but i mean th those guys i know of i've never ever turned a, a guy in computing round to say against the system. So I'm, I've never turned them into Uncle Ted. And be, because they, they're egotists. So I, I, I got caught out a number of times by people that faked me out. Whole teams have faked me out. They're just pretending to go along with, with the program when secretly they absolutely on the other side. They they want to make out like bandits, get rich. They all want to be Elon Musk and Bill Gates, and so they they read Ayn, Ayn Rand and they think in terms of you know the her bloody objectivism, and they and so they selfish little cunts to put it mildly, 
And so those guys have the a handful of those guys can can take it take it down and they will they out there i'll name them for you <laughs> oh shit that'll get me in Guantanamo. by the way i don't know any names <laughs> or addresses but they're out there so so those guys need to start working together so at the moment <clears throat> we're working together on the subjectivity synchronicity telephone at this level of winning hearts and minds and trying to explain the problem so that people people get it but we but we we will fail utterly uh, unless we get to the stage where where we can get more of a cadre like you know there, there are guys there are lots of hackers and guys um, you know black hat guys and stuff there out there gray hat even white, white hat guys that they do understand the problem they the problem is that they're not really they partial they're not really wedded to the ecology you do, you don't get someone uh, or I've never met him, someone like Derek Jensen, who has that passion and uh, feeling for nature and the salmon and the bears. And you, 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 you get guys that kind of get it in a kind of like, well, I like hiking and I, I don't want to see the, the glaciers disappear. You get that kind of guy, but then he goes back to, to program and he's on some wet fucking dream of blockchain for direct democracy or something it's never gonna work but you the very few guys that will go like okay i've got it unless we we sabotage the entire global industrial machine uh the living world is going to die and us along with it and then those guys that go all out there are not many of those there are not many of those that that have that holistic vision but that's the truth of where it is. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. But, uh, you know, the, the world does not need us or your techno-utopian dream. Your techno-utopian dream is superfluous to humanity, right? It's not a net benefit. No one on the, you, you work it out on, on whether this is a net benefit it's net benefit for a few pharaohs but for the average joe they getting fucked this you will never get get your techno utopian fully automated luxury communism to to work and um what you're going to do is you're going to snuff us all out uh trying but just know that you know the world doesn't need these ideologies they're superfluous to humanity the world doesn't need these technologies. They're superfluous to humanity. And humanity is superfluous to nature. Nature would get on very, very well if we just vaporize. So that's what I have to say for the ego. <laughs> oh, well, sorry that took so long, but needed to get that off my chest. No, that's that's, yeah. that's a very good expose. I hope there's people who who don't um, listen to the meetings usually who listen to this for the first time who will start to realize what is a complex system and yeah, you know it's yeah. uh, we've been discussing this now for over a year and reading your books or your your articles or the things you put on this on the sub, but. Today you've summarized this in a in a very very good way. Thank you for that, and for the people who who want to to look at this more deep. I think we we need to go over this again and again and again yeah. until until it gets yeah. some ears that that understand what we're talking about. Yeah, I've, I, the reason I'm so passionate about it is because I've had a number of conversations this week where I've upset people enough that they rage quit and walked out of the room, and the. The reason is that they, in, you know, everybody has their little immortality project. And, and so the arguments I've been having is people with Bitcoin and you know, blockchain and, and uh, yeah, you know, future in space. The one thing that really warmed my heart with Kevin is he says, I don't think we have a future in space. And they're like, well, you know, it's a pity he's not a software programmer and he's a virologist. Because anybody that understands that we are not going to the stars, that we're it. Um, so, yeah, just just last night, some, some, some guy had a hissy fit and stormed off because 
of this going to the stars thing. And uh, the reason is because he saw, he, he saw what I said was true. And basically it fucking ruined his, his, his thing. Yeah, but and those so, are dreams that have been inc inculcated to people since the 60s and, you know, in the in schools and in, in, in schools of science, of engineering, of all sorts of environment families. Uh, so you you asking to somebody you're asking from somebody to to dump his illusions his dreams it's always a hard it's always a hard process and you will be met with these rejections and and slamming doors and banging tables you will get that and you will get it again and again there's a yeah it's a direct reflection on ego so you, but you I'm don't getting, want I'm to getting... approach it that way I mean uh, what what I'm doing is just foolish it's it's really lack of discipline on and restraint on my part i shouldn't be doing it because th there's there's no real profit in it <clears throat> because the yeah, but you're doing it, at least you're doing it and you don't know you see for example i've given up trying to talk about the the vaccine for the sars cov2 because to other to colleagues because you're talking to religious people who don't want to question something that is an order that is given to them, even though they know perfectly well that the studies haven't been completed, that some of the licenses are being given only for emergency. There's there's so many, if at least they could say, well, yeah, we're not sure. And if they could be honest enough to say, well, to their patients, well, you know, we, you know, we don't really know, but you don't, you don't get that. And mm. I, I've given up because my energy and my emotions would, would run to uh, higher no, level. I, I, you know? norm, normally I just bite my tongue, but it, it's, it's, it's wearing on me particularly this week because there, there's, there was some bad signs. And, uh, and it's also freaked me out this week that we're getting temperatures in the 30s. It's just fucking ridiculous. And so, so I, I, I just get a little pissed off because these people are just on cloud nyanya. It's they they just and it's just this brain dead hopium and regurgitated slop from the internet. There's not an original thought, no insight. And I mean, I can laugh along and just kind of, but eventually it just gets. I, it's one of the flaws of mine that I I I, I endure it, endure it, and then I pop. And then everybody's shocked, and then like, we didn't know you were harboring these opinions. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, well, I obviously can't go walking around every day trying to beat everybody's head against a brick wall, much as I'd like to. It's just just takes the patience of Job, just listening to this horseshit day in day out. And it's it's just, it, oh, I'm, I'm just griping. Well, that's why it's easier to be a, to be a, in lockdown at the moment and to not see too many people. Because you, yeah, you know they say that a lot of people will enjoy it. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm definitely one of them. But yeah, that that's the thing is that uh, you I oscillate between feeling pity and hatred for these people because that they they need hope. They desperate hope habits. And um, it's it's the same thing that we keep on talking about this addiction, and so it's it's if they lost hope and gave up, we would have a chance. So I'm trying to make well, everything. How do you how do you how do you bring a, a, a around or how bring about despair? Well. It, they're gonna despair for sure. I mean, we're on the Titanic, and at some stage, everybody's like, "No, nah, they would tell us if there was anything wrong." I mean, at some stage, they're gonna be, "Fuck, this water's cold." So everybody gets it. It's basically it's just when do they get it? So it's it's, it's we're, we're on a ledge, and the ledge is shrinking, and so you can be as stupid as you like, but at some stage, you're gonna have to admit that we're fucked. And so it's everybody gets it. We're just in the avant-garde. I mean, some guys, um, Eric and all. Uncle Ted, those guys got it really early. Well, according to me, <laughs> I only mean, picked this up, you know, gradually. But the the but everybody gets it eventually. So what you're talking about is how do you get people there sooner? The the way is to make the system collapse. 
So, so a lot of the stuff I post is suggestions and then I'm, I'm just trolling people because um, and making them doubt the system, making them think that there are people out there that intend to, to take it away. Making, and so, so that, that is kind of PSYOPs erodes their certainty. So it's, we, we're assisted in PSYOPs because China and Russia, they're doing a great old PSYOPs. So, so the elephants, are, you know, the giants are actually, you know, John the giant killer. You just get throw pebbles at the giants and get them to kill each other. They're doing it. So, so when when I make shit post things about how we're going to war and everybody goes, oh, I'm fucking doom posting from you. It's like, I'm relishing it. See, the, the faster we can get uh, to war and get these guys against each other, the more, you know, you want to contribute to PSYOPs. Russia and China are doing it relentlessly. You can see on Reddit, they have tankies. I, I always put a little post on on uh, on XR Med, it's like anti tank. They always see you instantly as soon as it goes up. A few people, <laughs> a, few, a few people unsubscribe because they, they, some of the guys are anarchists out there, which are okay in this. They're these brain dead ideology, you know, ID politics, new breed of fuckhead anarchists that don't know what the fuck they are they on about. But if they're genuine anarchists, that that's cool, right? But the other thing is it gets tankies because they, they see all oh these guys are cool they understand the, the you know ecology might be a little bit eco fash we'll have to watch that and then they kind of kind of squat and then i put something about and about against israel or you know, against communism and call them tankies or something they fuck all. so what, what the tankies do is really funny what uh what somebody along the line told them um, and they do this very, very well, is that, is that the algorithms are looking for contention. So, so they, they creep in. You, you'll see them come in, and you can always tell, because if you go and have a look at their other posts, you can see they, they're doing agitprop for communism. So the, they come in like seedy little fucking uh, Amway or pyramid marketing scheme guys, which is funny enough from where I think of communism. But they, uh, they, they sneak in and they do a little thing where they say, you know, Karl Marx was an ecologist or some bullshit. And you're like, oh, yeah, fuck you. Karl Marx was an ecologist. So then I come back and I say something like, oh, yeah, so, so let me get this right. Karl Marx was an ecologist. The hammer is to beat nature into shape and the sickle is to cut nature down to size. And then they're like, Woof. <laughs> they come. you see, other guys will like come back. Is what they've told them is don't start getting into an argument because the algorithm picks that up, you know, in, on Reddit and says, oh, you, a lot of people are interested in this post and it starts boosting it. So they figured that out. And so if you say anything contentious, they disappear. And then they go and creep, creep, creep. Come in as a big creepers. And then they, uh, so they try that, that on. But, but it's really beautiful because what it means is you can say anything as damning as you like and all the commies leave the room. So it's like, thank you, I win. <laughs> you see that it's a very dumb tactic because it's at some stage they, they, they're going to not have any forum left. So they've got all like academia and the left wing and stuff. But the, you can't, you know, do this, hey, you know, kind of like sleazy Scientologist, hey, you know, do you want to see a business opportunity? Can I take you to my church? <laughs> like, you can't do that kind of evangelism because um, at some stage you're going to be called on your metal, and you're gonna, you're going to have to come out and say, argue your point, or otherwise you you will just have these little forums like our oh, communism and stuff like that. It's, and there you sit there, you know, trotskying your ass off. But you're not getting anywhere. They're basically, you're not recruiting. And, and you get any like jihadis or you're going to have a look at what the Islamic guys, they, they're making babies. That's how they recruit. So you're not going to get to communism that way. Well, they, But what they're working for is China and to promote China. And the China, the China side is they try and promote China as invincible, as China's inevitable, the rise of the East. And so, so I love posting the things that say, like, this is a paper tiger. China's not going anywhere. You, if you want to know where you don't want to be in the next 10 years, China. 
is basically you do not want to in the world we're going into you do not want to share your disaster with 1.4 billion desperate people so china is not a good place to be but uh, everything's wrong about china it's a it's exactly the same as japan so older people like me lived through this china bullshit uh with japan and so in the 80s it was america was terrified of the rise of japan and japan you know i remember in software uh everything japan did seemed to be invincible and everything you know high-tech stuff national semiconductor and stuff like this and then but they weren't really good at software and then miti went away ministry of technology in japan and then the miti went away and then and did a 10-year program on, on you know beating the world at it and we were shitting ourselves, waiting for what they would come back with. And then finally, after the 10 years were up, they unleashed on the world. And it was all it was is they came up with was fuzzy logic. So it, it lent itself more to Taoistic thinking and more hollow. So, you know, it's good for photography and so but they never swept swept the board with software. And then then but the the kind of Japanese terror carried on up until 1980. 1997 and then but i went through a period where people in america and the west were so scared of the japanese school system we retooled the entire american school system to compete with japan in the 80s it we never had to because what japan was doing is exactly the same thing as china it was fake growth it was it was basically they were funding a ponzi scheme and so in, in 1997, there was the aging contagion and Japan disappeared. Just we just completely went out of the mind space. So when it went from where China is today is the big threat. And in, in there was the aging contagion within a year. China's gone. I mean, Japan's gone. Who even talks about it? Japan is such a powerful country. It's completely outside of the Western mindset. I try and find an article in the New York Times on Japan or the threat, <laughs> it's like all gone, all gone, just disappeared. And China's it's exactly the same way, funding yeah. it. It happened at the end and in the end of the 80s, early 90s, it was suddenly just, and there was the a Asian contagion in 97. Yeah. Not by 98, it was all over. Yeah, yeah. yeah Japan, right. Japan was a zombie after that, a zombie economy, lost generations. Now, they, Japan's never going to be a threat because, um, you know, regardless of climate change and stuff, the demographics have, have taken over. So, so I, I posted that 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 video that the guy does about you know why China is going to collapse is, is absolutely right because the the demographics are moving along. So by the time the, yeah. the miracle is already waning, by the time the crap demographics comes, um, so so they they're going to try and automate and push into a highly automated society. It's like well, there's a war. I mean, you're, the, it's, is, a resource yeah. war. It's, it's a resource war. That, so, that so, video on China that you posted was extremely interesting. Yeah, but, but you see, people downvote it. They, they, they don't like it because the, the, the communists are brigading it. And there, there are a lot of, uh, I think there are a lot of um, Chinese PSYOPs guys out there that downvote shit like that. Yeah, well, if, if you are trying to, you're going against the scarecrow that everybody's shaking china the danger of china and you're putting a video where you're showing that china is going to collapse you're not you're not playing the game like nobody's gonna like that <laughs> well america likes it too right yeah. you see they china and america both want china to look like a big buggy man mm -hmm. yeah. so so again it's you know the elephants uh competing and so we just need to throw stones we just need to get more people that understand the game yeah. yeah, it's that um it's that saying war is the health of the state. Yeah. Yeah, but but it can be the health of anarchists. That's what I'm encouraging people. Um you, you see all these things are paper tigers. They they rely I, you know, I gotta find a better way of saying it, but they rely on bluff. All these empires are based on bluff. If you go it's it's not easy to see because 
historians don't write it into the history books. You have to kind of be on the ground. But I lived it in Africa. The basically, uh, colonial colonialism in Africa was one giant bluff. As soon as the Africans called our bluff, it was over. And the same, China's a bluff, America's a bluff. You know, all these, all these magnificent things, this huge military machine where they continually show, you know, F-16, no, F-16, um, uh, Hornets or whatever, the Falcons, whatever. Well, anyway, the blasted things on the carriers. Those are the F-19s, I think. They, they, you know, they're rolling off the deck and they show you all these guys going around you, like America projecting its power. It's, it's horseshit. It's horseshit. So I'll tell you. Oh, risk of doxing myself. Fuck it. Okay. Hopefully I'm into this deep enough into this. I did. I worked on the crew management systems on those carriers. When I worked on those crew management systems, I realized America's fucked. America's not a so basically where America's at. If we, if we go into a world war, America's going to lose, and I'll tell you why. Because it's only got three days of fighting in it. It's it's relying too much on this technology, and it's very very brittle. So, or if you go into a real war, if you're really in the army, in a wartime army, not a peacetime army, which is fake, you. If you're in a wartime army, what you find out is things get gritty, dirty, fucking muddy and horrible. Nothing fucking works in a real war. They see everything. War is high entropy. War is fog of war. There's not only the fog of war, there's the mud and the disease and the fucking, just the sheer fucking dribbling entropy of war. And so you cannot take Swiss watches and high tech and it'll be useless in days because because it's just too complicated to get the power cord to into the iPhone that manages the drone. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, you're not going to get that together in the fucking rain after an EMP where everybody's starving and fucking cholera is broken out. So just, you need, you the army's got to be rugged. You, the army needs to be trained to eat shit and enjoy it. You've got to be like the foreign legion. You must basically... That's what Genghis Khan used to say. Yeah, basically the Gurkhas. You want to be a Gurkha? Or a Gurkha, like in Nepal. In Nepal, yeah. The British used to go and get the Gurkhas. They were yeah, because uh, because they were hard as shit. Yeah. I, I heard one guy, a Parabat, told me in in the who worked with the Gurkhas. I'll tell you the story because I, I find it so funny. And they were they were doing um, the they were going to para, para drop the the Gurkhas in. Um, and so yeah, this is the Brit, right? Special Forces. And so these guys are as hard as anything. If they draw their kukuri, whatever the knife is called, they, they, they have to draw blood before they stick it back in. So they cut themselves before they stick it back in. So that's, how, that's how tough these fuckers are. So, so anyway, nothing scares these buggers at all. And so the guy is explaining, okay, we'll, we'll come in on the C-130. We'll do an insertion uh, at 500 feet. Uh, everybody will deploy and, and, and basically and he could see that they were <laughs> visibly getting worried. And he went, surely this, this is not that bad. I mean, 500 feet is a little low, but like, you know, these guys are tough. They should be able to do it. And eventually he stopped talking. He says, you guys look a little worried. And they said, what, what are you worried about? He said, well, it's a 500 feet. And they said like, well, it's, we have to go in that low. And, uh, you know, your parachute should be able to deploy fine. And suddenly the room just like suddenly relaxed. And they said, like, oh, we get parachutes. Okay. <laughs> That's how tough those guys are. <laughs> they just assumed they would <laughs> chuck them out the back of their aircraft. They didn't even expect parachutes. So, so that's how you got to be. But when you look at these crew management systems and that is what they, they do is they, they, I found it very interesting, and I want to say this to to Alison um, McDowell, is uh, her things with uh, the kids that they're training them on, the crew management systems on those carriers are exactly the same. So, so the stuff I programmed was uh, you, all the guys would do their training on this integrated system, one, one integrated system. So 
any bit of equipment that needs to move, a little Hobart, a little fuel thing, a little generator, you have to certify on it. And then you, you go through the course and it's done on, on the same system and then you get your little badge and then you're allowed to touch this generator. Then, uh, and then you move up in the grades, it's, you get your badge. And the, so then when they come to like launch a, um, a fighter or something or put armaments on it and ordnance, then what the guy the guys do is say, okay, we're going to arm this um, this uh, Hornet for ground attack. Then they get the little task for ground attack, and it says, oh, you move this generator, you get this bomb rack, you get, and they stick this all in the computer, and then they say, okay, who's who's who can do the bomb rack, who can do the thing, and then they build up the the deck crew by saying, you know, this E two engineer is uh, able to, you know man this uh, little generator or something and then they assemble all of that and then you know they tell uh, all the guys to assemble and gives them give them uh their task list and then they go off and that's that's why it looks so efficient because that's all all done and then then you know some guy with a camera making a documentary sees all these guys running around the deck and remarkably efficient doing everything and it looks fucking tremendous when i did those systems all I could think about is the old movies, the black and white movies and stuff of, say, the Lexington or the Battle of Midway and all of those guys in World War II. Because what I realized was you see these, um, you know, zeros, these kamikazes coming into the deck. And all these guys, this, the sailors would run on the deck. You'd see guys getting hoses, guys getting sand, guys getting water, other guys, you know, moving aircraft. They were all doing it from their own smarts, right? They, they could all do everybody's job. You didn't have all this crap. Um, it was all kind of informal and it was very resilient. They could take hits that looked like the carrier was a goner. And they, these guys would just rally and fix everything up in hours. And what I realized is on one of these things like the Eisenhower, these big nuclear things, is all it takes to take them out is you have one guy who's Chinese, so you can't you can't say anything because that would be politically incorrect. So you've got to let the guy on, but you know damn well that he basically has been through the PLA before he joined the US military. But anyway, he's an immigrant and so left-wing woke, can't say anything, that would be racist. But this little bastard has been given a thumb drive from the PLA before he even went to America. And I know that for a fact, I've met some of these assholes. And they basically, they, they stick the little thumb drives in at the universities. Then basically you let them on a carrier, they'll do it. Basically, so I, me, I couldn't program those sy systems to fuck up because I was a contractor and basically I'd have to turn the software over to the Navy. The Navy would vet every single line of it to make sure that nobody did a little backdoor in it or something like that. And then basically it would go through a number of security steps before it could get onto carrier. But when it's on the carrier, any little bastard with a thumb drive can take that system down. Then what's going to happen is like, okay, we're going to launch the, the Hornets now. Um, but all the screens are dark. The guy's going to be on a bullhorn going, say, hey, is there anybody that knows how to do this? Uh, does anybody know the task list to actually put, you know, this configuration on the, this bit of equipment? It's like they'll be fucked. They're basically they one thumb drive away from that being the biggest bit of floating metal in the sea. So it's basically that that's the biggest bit of scrap iron you've ever seen is one of those those carriers. So that's how long they're going to last. So you know it's 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 hours. It's all basically America is, is has to win that war within hours. If they blink, they they're done. And and so it's it's not it's not. As I said before, that's the war they want to fight. So it's definitely not the war they're going to fight. Because they say the enemy's going to make sure that you're not going to get the war you want. So it's easy. The Chinese are just going to string it out. And they have an army of a million people that are, that the PLA is millions of people. They just have to make it a grinding ground war. And America's fucked. The GIs will be crying because their fucking cell phones don't work. Those guys are wimps. <laughs> I'll say it in a bar. <laughs> in the <US> <laughs> they, they are literally wimps because they're not, 
I, I, if you don't believe me, don't don't smack me in the bar, in the face in a, with a beer in a bar if you're one of those guys. But I, I'm trying to be kind to you and tell you that that how much of your training, if you're one of those guys, was grueling desert training or, or survival training that basically was just designed to fuck you up. Sure, you had a bit of in boot camp and you had a bit in officer training, but when you go and play a war game. You, you have an integrated battleground, you have mosaic, what they call mosaic, it's an integrated battlefield where all the drones talk to each other and the guys don't even appear and they're all sitting somewhere in Tennessee with a joystick. They say like, mm -mm, that ain't the war you're gonna fight, dude. That war is gonna be over quick. And then the guy who's sitting on the joystick with a fat beer belly in Tennessee, he's gonna be put on a C-130 or something uh, on, a, on a plane and shipped out to the Far East. And he's going to cry because he hasn't, you know, not used to this shit. He, he's not trained for jungle warfare and the first insect that bites him, he's going to be in the, in the med, in, you know, he's going to have to see a medic. <laughs> that, that ain't the way it's going to be, man. So it's going to be gritty. And so America ca cannot fight a gritty war. They're going to have to fight, a, they cannot fight a war of attrition. So it's all logistics and electronics and a big circle jerk. So America is extremely vulnerable. And, in, and I, that's just the material, war material. But if you look in terms of the information and the way the inflammation flows, it's, it, it's gonna jam up. On day one, that information gonna jam up. And I can prove it to you. I can show you on 9-11. On 9-11, I'm absolutely certain that all the communication systems that they put in place, they, they all fucked up. And the reason was, they didn't know that everybody would call mom. The telecommunications were overwhelmed by everybody calling mom and they didn't work. So anyway, I just paint that as a picture. And the whole point of this is PSYOPs to say, don't believe this, they pay for tigers. Just, just see, if we can ever get people to start testing the system, then, then uh, that gets people over. You see them at the moment, they're all scared. The middle class is all running scared, A, because they don't believe it's so bad. And, and you know, it's not really an emergency. And, and uh, B, because they're petrified. The, the guys have done a good job in telling us we live in this panopticon and stuff. And so, uh, so but when they start testing, it, they'll start, start realizing that it's, it's all a paper tiger. And when, when they realize it's a paper tiger and, and call its bluff, it's as good as over. It happened in South Africa. In, in, uh, there's this very interesting, and I'll just say this one thing and then stop. And then, but it happened to us in South Africa. There was this thing called Sasselberg. So it was the pride of South Africa because we had oil sanctions and, but lots of coal. So we used this German technology from World War II, in fact, but the Germans had to use, they, they also was in the same position in World War II. They had lots of coal and no oil. So they did this uh, oil from coal program and South Africa did exactly the same with a lot of German guys. And uh, so it was basically the pride of South Africa because we had defeated the oil sanction sanctions and could make oil. The ANC went and bombed it and it sent shockwaves through through the country it 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 can I think some people credit it with being one of the turning points in the war against apartheid and the reason was it was psychologically devastating because it was such an icon of pride that the average person thought that it was so well guarded and and everything that it, it you know the child the thought of the anc blowing it up was just it's huge plant and stuff and uh, they only disabled it for like th I think about five days or something, but but that was enough to destroy the public's uh, idea of the um, invincibility of the government. So the the same applies to all governments. If if there's ever a spectacular and they can't catch the guys, they're in the government is in very deep trouble because it shows they're powerless. You see the you see what happened in. In 9-11, they couldn't catch the guys because they died in the planes, right? So they had to invent, you know, Osama bin Laden and all these other characters to go after because, because they couldn't be perceived in the public eye 
to being have such a big hit that fucking devastated everything, but they couldn't do anything about it. So they had to just, you know, it, it was absurd in the end, the lengths they went to, to make a scapegoat. But, but the reason they're doing that is because it's a bluff. All the security and stuff, and it's all a bluff. So that's my sermon for today. <laughs> Shit, did anybody have any real questions? Apart from covering. Well, did, did, it, did it make sense what I'm saying? Or did anybody get any? Or should, should... No, it's good. It's good. Um... Good. It's good. It's good. It's been. It's nearly two hours now, so okay. Yeah, it's, so it's basically the whole military thing, and the government's like a boogeyman. Like it's like believing in a monster in your closet. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes, William Golding and Lord of the Flies, and then Simon goes to go and confront the boogeyman and finds out it's fuck all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the whole the whole you you answered actually to quite a few subjects that we were going to approach um i would like if we maybe next time talk well you did when you talked about the the intersubjectivity and the the gigantic the mega organism or whatever you call it but super organism that, that yeah. was you know, wilson's phrase yeah. yeah i think that's that's really a a concept on which it would be nice to come back again and again to yeah yeah i, I, I have quite a bit so of stuff to to say on the, the structure of how those systems function mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and, and why they exist. It's a big insight into life itself. So it's yeah. hugely interesting. Yes. Well, well let, should we just go out on a bang with uh, doing the exercise? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead. <laughs> Unless anybody's got anything else, then we should. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's fall still. Eventually, we can just get to just completely falling still and just in one shot, just to all the the parts of this exercise in one. But let's just go through in a long inventory. And but it doesn't need to be this much rigmarole once you get used to the habit. So sit balanced and erect with your feet placed on the floor, not not crossed, just um, evenly. Your knees at right angles, hopefully, your spine straight, your neck straight, as if the crown of your head is really being hung on a thread, so you're hanging down, kind of like a marionette, in, and your hands on your thighs. And then just relax, and do that by just noticing where there's any tension, muscular tension. And start from the top, in your brow, around your eyes, around your jaw, just make sure you're Jaw isn't clenched, your neck. Don't make any exaggerated movements. Just, just notice the tension in the muscle and just let it go. In your shoulders, stomach, thighs, legs, and feel your weight on the chair. Feel your clothes on your skin. Now let your gaze just fall behind your eyes. Become aware of your breathing. Stay with your attention focused within your, your head or your behind your eyes and notice the hearing. Go out to the farther sound or rather let the further sound come to you while you keep your attention and your feeling of embodiment. Just rest in the furthest sound you can hear. Become aware of all your senses, taste, smell, touch, Sight behind your eyes and relax deeply. Okay.
Nice. <laughs> well, have a good week and uh, yeah. hope you'll talk to Kevin again. Yeah, I'll contact yeah. I'll contact Kevin again. Uh, we should do maybe this with Kevin. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we should uh <laughs> to freak him out. No, just at the beginning of the <laughs> or... <laughs> the music and then I, I think at the end. At the end, at the end. end. And... But yeah. Then, okay. Yeah. But he, he always goes out on, on like, you know, he's got distractions and stuff. So yeah. he's got to leave, so it never, doesn't really. Yeah, that's why I was looking at the distractions. They were. I noticed. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that super organism stuff really got under his skin, too. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> trying to. I was trying to like, lose page a bit. But I, I, I was going to, I was going to send him a, a link to the the movie Society, and then I thought, no, I can't do that. <laughs> 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 That's a brutal movie. Though. My mind, because I don't think it would go down very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that can easily be taken as you know conservative yeah. society. No, no, it's 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 extreme. It could be taken a lot of wrong ways. <laughs> it could be the baby eating Satanists, but it could just as easily <laughs> be the Christians. <laughs> oh. No, I just played with the thought. Um, I would, I, I just, just, just uh, no. <laughs> okay, uh, he didn't answer your question about uh, you know the specifics of what that guy got wrong. Mm. Yeah, but uh, but there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of good stuff in what he says, so I think it's mm. worth engaging again. You got some yeah. insights that are quite interesting, you know. It's it's nice to to talk talk to him, but yeah, the kind of boys club thing is like uh, kind of <laughs> hard wearing. <laughs> <laughs> There's like not a lot of meat and a lot of starch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Meat's, meat's bad somebody, for you. Somebody said meat has, meat's bad for you and has a lot of saturated fat. <laughs> Go easy on the oh. meat. Go easy on the meat. And cheese too. Oh yeah. So the fact no woman ever went to the moon. Um, Tells me no man did either. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, talking of which, Collins died today. Oh, yeah. He was Colin. one of the three guys. Uh, the in, guy who stayed in the command module. Uh, in 69. And Neil Armstrong went down to oh, the moon. Wow. Uh, but, yeah, that was a, what a waste of time that expedition was. <laughs> He was eating. He was eating too much meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, hi guys, we're ruining a planet, but hey, we made it to our moon, right? Yeah, it's yeah. One of those yeah, yeah it's just you get an advanced picture of what the Earth is going to look like soon. Oh. Makes me think of fireworks. <laughs> <gasps> so great! And oh God, I hate fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we had take fireworks a bit, last take, night. Take, bad, bad fireworks here. B vitamins are good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, B vitamins. <laughs> they have them in me. Everything comes in pill form eventually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.